Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to look at another collaboration beer. This one is half Swedish on the home side and half American on the away side. And both breweries I've had very good experiences with before, albeit the American brewery. I do need to see about getting some dedicated reviews done for them. So for this one then, we are going to head up towards Gothenburg, which is the Swedish craft beer capital, as I've told you many a time. And we're trying yet another beer from Beer Bibliothek, and this is a collaboration that they've done with Finback from over in Queens in New York and America. You would have seen me review their collaboration, The Fade to Green, with Amundsen a few videos back. But this particular beer is called the They're Playing Our Song, number 269, according to the Beer Bibliothek numbering system, and it's a New England IPA coming in at 7.5% ABV. So really curious to see how this one turns out. Beer Bibliothek, one of my favourite Swedish breweries, always trying different styles and things, which is one of the great things about them. The last beer I had from them was a beautiful um, West Coast IPA, um, and uh, I think it was called I'm not aware this is happening, something like that. Um, but that was a beautiful, beautiful beer. And, you know, as I say, Finback, that's one of the breweries that I do hope to visit when I'm over in the States in September. So you might well see an out and about video at their tap room. That's definitely a must do for me. But really looking forward to trying this one. This was released on the 14th of February 2020 through the Small Partiers to Felix Sortiment, whatever you want to call it and say Stimbo Laget here in Sweden and knowing these breweries I think this one will be a pretty interesting beer. So let's see how we get on with it. I hope that you guys enjoy my take on this one then. So as always with my reviews I'll tell you a little bit about the breweries that are involved here before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting just fast forward. All the usual links are in the description below. That's the brewery websites, the link to my other reviews that I've done from Beer Bibliothek and my other reviews involving Finback Brewing, like I say, hopefully some dedicated reviews to them sometime later in the year. There's all the usual social media down there as well. If you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The whole channel, of course, has a geography-based tagging system, so you can go into the homepage and search for beer based on country, city, state, county, prefetch, or whatever it is you're interested in. Do check out the playlist of beers from different countries. There is one there for all the Swedish beers that I've reviewed for you, and another one for all the American beers. Both of those are being added to very, very regularly. And as always, please do get in touch and let me know some of the other beers and breweries that you guys would like to see me review. It's always great to hear from you guys that are watching the videos and the support that you show the channel is hugely, hugely appreciated. So anyway, on to my brewery notes then to tell you a little bit about Beer Blue Tech then. So as I mentioned to you earlier, this brewery is based in Gothenburg and they were founded back in 2013 by a multi-national group of friends. This is Adam Norman who's from Australia, Richard Bull who's a Kiwi, New Zealand, Anders Hedlund who's a Swede, and Darden Ecker, who is from South Africa. So Adam and Richard ran Bar Doppio in Gothenburg, and then Daryl and Anders were regular customers at the bar, and they often just used to sit and chat away about beer, and one day they decided that they were going to buy a kit and brew their own, and then you had the birth of Beer Bibliothek. So the original brewery that they had is in the old Klepan Sugar Building, which is a really nice old building, very close to the old Carnegie Brewery in Gothenburg. Quite a famous beer brand, that. That's one that I do need to review for you on the channel at some point. Um, but their brew kit that they had in there was from Brewfab in Scotland and in their first year they produced 38 different beers and that is one of the mantras that this brewery has kind of tried to stick to but all of their beers are brewed in very kind of small batches so that they're sticking to the home brewing roots and um, for a period of time they were very rarely producing the same beer and they didn't have a fixed range although that has changed slightly in recent times because certain beers were very popular so they were brought back and there are other beers that um, seem to be released um, every year so they've got eternal darkness and eternal dankness there's new versions of those every year as well but in 2015 they opened a second brewery in Kungston which is where they now have their tap room and run their main brewing operations. The old brewery is now used for producing their sour beers and they're also working on a barrel aging project in the new brewery as well. And you have seen me review one or two beers from that barrel aging project as well. And that, I think, I forget the name of it, but it was a beautiful um, barley wine. Actually. I'm sure it had like tonka beans or something in it, but it was an absolutely stunning, stunning beer that. So if you get the chance to try some of the barrel aged beers from Beer Bibliothek, I really recommend that you do. But the idea behind the name Beer Blue Tech is that they wanted to brew a wide variety of beers so that their customers were always kind of learning about you know for example a new type of hop a new type of malt or even like a new type of yeast or adjunct or things like this so the idea 
the, the name was taken from the Latin word, I think it was, for um, for library, so biotech, um, or bibliotech, so yeah, beer bibliotech, and um, they want to basically create a library of beer, which I think is pretty damn cool. But one of the things that's always impressed me about beer bibliotech, um, from their early days, was that they were producing um, beers just kind of as pilot batches and they always turned out to be very, very nice actually. So they're a very, very able brewery in my experience. And they're not scared to try different styles as well. So I always try to make an effort with these guys to try different styles when they're released. But definitely one to keep an eye on if you're interested in Swedish beer. And I'm hoping that I can get a hold of the Scotch Ale that is part of their uh, Barrel Age series. But I don't think that's been released through System Bullaget yet. So we'll need to see about that one. But yeah, a very nice brewery from Gothenburg this one and uh, one that I definitely recommend that you check out. Hopefully the next time I get up to uh, to Gothenburg I can go and film around their tap room a little bit and uh, Dal Donecker, I've been in contact with him, uh, he messaged me after a couple of reviews and was offering to do a little interview and things like that so we'll need to see about sorting that out too but yeah that's all you really need to know about beer bibliotech for the moment if you want to learn more you can check out the brewery website in the description below you can follow them on facebook and instagram and things to keep up to date with all the latest goings on and you can check out the rate beer untapped and beer advocate pages to learn more about all the different beers that they do but the website does have quite an extensive list of all of these too so um yeah on to the american side of things then to Finback Brewing. So Finback Brewing, as I've told you before, are based in the Glendale area of Queens in New York, which is out to the east of Manhattan. If I remember correctly, that is like the southern part of Long Island, but there's so many islands in that area, I might be wrong about that. Don't take my word on that. Um, but the brewery was founded by Basil Lee, who's a former architect, and Kevin Stafford, who was a graphic artist, but the two of them were also quite avid home brewers. The company itself was founded back in 2011, but it took them quite a while to, uh, quite a while, rather, to find a location and they settled on their current brewery in 2013 and they produced their first beers there in 2014 with the tap room opening later that year. But apparently the name Finback comes from their location. They're located about a 30 minute walk from the nearest subway stations because the two lines that are close to them diverge and so they're right in the middle. So they basically termed themselves um, a beached whale. And originally they were going to call the brewery Narwhal, but then Sierra Nevada, of course, released that Imperial Stout. And uh, initially Sierra Nevada had agreed to withdraw the name of the beer after it had sold out. And they didn't plan on uh, re-brewing it, but it won a gold medal and uh, it went back into production. And so the guys felt it wasn't a good idea to challenge this. And this, of course, all happened before the brewery had actually opened its doors. So they then decided to go with um, with Finback Brewery. I can't imagine these guys being called something else, to be honest, but an interesting story nonetheless. But over the last few years they've been gradually expanding and they're now in the process of working on a second brewery in the Goanis area in Brooklyn which will also have a distillery a coffee roastery and a dumpling shop as well. And I can understand that because if you've watched the channel before you will know that because my partner is Japanese, she loves the craft beers as well. We quite often do uh, beer and gyoza. Um, so I think that the dumplings, if they can do the sort of Japanese style gyoza, I think that will be um, a really big hit for them actually. And of course, Modern Times over in America, that's the other one that seems to have a coffee um, roastery these days. Um, but they also have a farm outside of the city as well, from what I understand. And as of February 2020, when I'm filming this review for you, they've produced somewhere in the region of 400 different different kinds of beer, which is pretty impressive, I have to say. But um, yeah, a really nice brewery, this one, one that gets a lot of plaudits for its hazy type IPAs. So like I said, hopefully I can get out there in September and take a little look at them. This is That's one of the breweries that I really want to help along with the likes of Fifth Hammer, um, Other Half, and there's a few other ones that I have in mind for the New York area as well. So um, yeah, that's all you need to know about Finback. If you want to learn more, of course, you can check out the brewery website. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on. Um, you can check out the Rate Beer Untapped and uh, Beer Advocate pages as well to learn more about the different beers that they've done. But again, these guys do also have a good little bit of stuff on the website as well but they are quite prolific so probably the the peer review sites are a little bit better for keeping you up to date on that but um, or indeed their own social media but um, yeah let's get on and actually have a taste of this beer then so as you can see this one is in the standard 330 ml can that you get with beer bibliotech and you can see the artwork on this again it's, it's their kind of typical style but I love the uh, the sound waves and stuff that's on this there you can see um, 
that artwork on this is very, very nice. Apparently this beer uses Sabro hops, which have been getting very, very popular. And they're really interesting because it's another orangey hop. And if you've watched the channel before, you will know that I'm a sucker for things like Azaka, Amarillo, Mosaic, Waiiti. Um, Pacifica, Mandarina, Bavaria, all these big orangey hops I really really enjoy um, so this one I'm very curious about but Sabro from what I understand um, I've had it once or twice and I remember it being quite different because it had quite an almost minty um, floral quality to it but it was also quite orangey and there was like some coconutty type stuff going on in it as well so um, yeah it's, it should be pretty interesting that um, but yeah it says on the side here New England IPA as usual we've made friends with these world beaters at festivals over beers and as usual there's music and dancing involved and every time they've been playing our song say hello at beerbibliotech.com and finbackbrewery.com so um, yeah one of the other touches I always say that I like when it comes to beer bibliotech is they always put a product of Sweden on that Swedish craft beer and I do like that and it's, it's one of the weird things is because this three of the four owners of this brewery are not Swedish and I wish more Swedish breweries would do that with their beers it'd be quite I think that's quite a cool thing to build um, the international side of things you know to put your national flag on the, the beers at the back I think is quite a nice little touch because then people know what country it's coming from like the Slovenian breweries I think that's something that they should uh, be doing as well because they've got some awesome beer but it doesn't really get out there all that much. So, um, yeah, lovely looking beer this one. Let's get it out and we'll get on with the tasting. They, they're playing our song at 7.5% New England IPA, number 269, according to the Beer Bibliotech numbering system. And there's some awesome fruits, uh, fruit aromas coming out of this as we open up. That smells absolutely lovely. I'm not sure if this is a single hopped. Sabro beer. It did just say on the website that this one uses Sabro. Um, Amar Brauke, it's one of my favourite Danish breweries, they've got a, a, a Sabro beer as well that I need to have a look at. So I'll need to wait for the next batch of that to come out and see if I can pick it up. But yeah, as you can see with this one, this has poured a lovely, bright, hazy. This one's kind of in between the yellow and orangey side of things. It's one of the darker, sort of yellowy coloured New England IPAs that you're going to come across. You can see there's a solid, um, what's that, that's a two-third finger of a frothy, I would say kind of creamy coloured head on this one. It's quite perfect white in the middle, but I think round the edge it does become a little bit more creamy. One or two big bubbles sticking towards the side of the glass there, and a few little ones just heading up towards the, uh, the bottom of that head there. But I mean, overall, it does look very very nice I have to say. So um, yeah, let's have a look at the aroma then of this one and see how we get on. Ooh, yeah. That's really very nice. Um, it's actually, the first thing that strikes me about this beer is you can get this kind of coconutty, woody type thing. You smell that in the malt base. Um, that's just the first thing that strikes me about this. There's a lot of really interesting kind of undertones. It almost gives the beer just a little hint of a kind of farmhousey type vibe. The fact that it has all these sort of woody notes to it. But on top of that, once your nose adjusts to it a bit more, you start to get the kind of... Um, you really start to get the more kind of creamy, wheaty, oaty type stuff that you would normally expect. So, for me... On top of that kind of woody and coconutty vibe that the beer has, you've got a nice kind of bit of bitey wheat, and for me that means it leans to more towards the kind of trillium side of things. I'm going through this phase just now with reviews where, but the AZ IPAs I always kind of um, compare them to the, the big four of the for me the big three because I don't have experience of uh, Hill Farmstead at the moment. But yeah, this one definitely has a bit more of that trillium kind of wheaty bite to the aroma for me. You do get some of the oaty creaminess in there, but the wheatiness is jumping out of the glass um, of this one for me. So I like that about it. I do like, you know, it depends what mood I'm in. I do like some of the smoother and creamier New England IPAs, but um, I do like a little bit of wheaty bite to them as well. So, yeah, you can definitely get that. Lots of kind of nice bitey wheat. There is a little bit of an oaty creaminess in there. I'm getting a wee bit of biscuit as well which again is what you'd expect, but to me that all sits on top of this kind of woody um, backbone that the beer has, and that's the really interesting point about this one, but I think this is going to be a big, thick, kind of creamy beast, to be honest with you. 
So yeah, um, on the hoppy side of things then, for me this beer does have a good little bit of floral character to it and it really comes across as quite sort of spicy. Like I said, Sabro, um, it does have, it was Peter at the Master of Hoppets that kind of got me onto this descriptor actually. Um, I'm sure when, when uh, maybe a year or two ago, and it was just when Sabro was starting to come out, we had a beer that had Sabro in it and he was describing it as being more um, sort of minty. I mean, described it as being almost kind of minty fresh kind of thing. Um, and you really get, an, uh, the Sabro normally has that about it, so I'm curious to see how that comes out in the flavour, but in the aroma, it comes across as really kind of quite spicy, not quite as minty fresh right enough, but there is a good little bit of a spicy note to this one. There's some grassy notes in there, but I think that takes a bit of a back seat as well. And on the fruity side of things, there's some really interesting stuff going on here with this one. So, um, there's definitely some nice juicy oranges to it, but I think there's a slightly stronger kind of passion fruity note in behind it as well. And you know, Sabro, I think it can give you some of the, the tropical fruit notes, um, but I, I always remember Sabro as being more orangey, coconutty and sort of minty as the way Peter described it. And that's just something that's always stuck with me. Um, but yeah, there is a hint of a kind of darker tropical fruit in there, like a passion fruit. I don't think it's quite strong enough to be um, to be a grapefruit, although, I don't know, people go on about pink grapefruit, maybe. Um, but yeah, definitely some stronger tropical fruit notes in there, kind of juicy oranges. There is a little bit of a kind of zestiness to the beer as well, but that might be... As I say, the mintiness is a bit kind of hard to detect in the aroma, I think, but it's sort of mixing in with that kind of spicy floral note that the beer has. So, I mean, overall, this is a really quite interesting one, quite bitey in its sweetie qualities. There is some creaminess to it, a little bit of biscuit, nice big spicy floral notes for me, and some interesting um, fruity characters as well, some darker tropical notes, but also a bit of that kind of juicier orange. So um, yeah, take a bit of time and enjoy the aroma of this one, but we're going to have a taste of it now and see how we get on. So this one is number 269. They're playing our song, a 7.5% New England IPA from Beer Bibliotheque in Gothenburg here in Sweden and Thingback Brewery who are originally from Queens over in New York in America, but soon opening up in Brooklyn as well. Let's get stuck in. Slange Skull. That's really very, very nice. Um, first impressions then. This beer, it very much um, strikes me as being a very smooth but also quite oily um, New England IPA. And the way that the flavour evolves into the aftertaste with this is really very, very nice. Um, it's not quite as wheaty and bitey as I was expecting. You get a little bit of that, but it's, it is quite different, I think, from the aroma in that regard. But I'll say straight away, thumbs up to them on this. And this is what I love trying about these things. I've complained on the channel often that there's so many hazy IPAs out there these days, but I do enjoy them, don't get me wrong on that. Um, but it's great when you try things from different breweries and you get all these little different nuances and things like that actually. Um, it's I, I still enjoy reviewing these beers, especially when they're with hops that you don't find so often actually. Sabro I know is gaining a lot of popularity in the States. Um, I think Sabro and Galaxy sort of came out at the same time, but in Europe, in my experience, a lot of breweries, or at least in Scandinavia, a lot of breweries were using the Galaxy. Sabro hasn't been taken in quite as much actually, although now that I think about it, maybe Sabro was released um, a year or so afterwards. So I don't know how accurate that statement is, but this is a lovely New England IPA from uh, from Beer Bibliotheque, so um, yeah, have a go at it, and it makes me even more curious mm. about the ones uh, that Finback are doing. You know, the the other collaboration I had from these guys, they've obviously been over here, but they did one, the Fade to Green, with uh, with Amundsen, and it was it was lovely as well. So yeah, obviously a very capable brewery. But yeah, this one is really very nice. Let's try and break this flavour down a little bit then. So, middle of your palate, um, you can feel, the further you go into the aftertaste, it comes out a bit more, but the white, bready, wheaty quality, that's forming the kind of backbone of the beer, but it's only later in the aftertaste you can feel the wheat sort of pushing its way out a bit. Initially, when you take this beer in, it's very smooth and very kind of... Um, 
and creamy, like the oats and the oaty smoothness really come out more towards the front of the palate. If you go to the very centre of your tongue, you've got a little bit of that biscuity note in there. I'm wondering from this one if there is a little bit of dextrose or dextrin or something in here, but it does just say on the can, water, malt, oats, hops and yeast. Um, so I'm wondering then, does that mean there's no wheat? There might actually not be any wheat in this one, I'd be surprised um, if there wasn't. It says, it says, it, yeah, it just says corn malt, because it would normally say veta malt as well. So that's an interesting point. Um, I'm surprised then that I was picking up some of the wheaty notes in the in the aroma, but really to me it does kind of come across like there is a good bit of wheat in this one, um, especially towards the back of the palate, it does have a little bit of that bitiness to it. But at the same time, the further that I go into the aftertaste with this, it does, I find it becomes a little bit more crisp at the back of the palate, so maybe there's a wee touch of Pilsner malt in here, and I have noticed that is a trend, seems to be a bit of a trend amongst um, Scandinavian brewers these days to put a little bit, little bit of Pilsner malt into their beers to give them a little bit more crispness actually, but this is definitely one of the sort of thicker and more oily um, New England IPAs that I've had when I come to think about it recently. But this is really, really very nice. I like how this all goes together. Malt base, as I say, is pretty kind of straight up and, and smooth. Um, and it builds, the smoothness of that just lingers there into the aftertaste. It doesn't have a great degree of sweetness right enough. It really is more about the kind of the smoothness actually, and I think that suits it. Um, on the hoppy side of things then, back corners of the palate there is a tiny, tiny little bit of earthiness. As you move further forward though, that kind of, it does sort of spread forward a little bit. It almost has a little bit of woodiness to it, the earthiness as well, which is interesting. But as you move further forward to the front corners of the palate, it gets a little bit more kind of floral and there's a wee touch of spice there. But as you go around the front edge of the palate, you get some a little bit of grassiness, but on the very kind of tip of your tongue, it does have that kind of minty edge that I was talking about too. I really like that descriptor for it actually, so, you know, I have to give Peter, the, the Peter um, Master of the Hoppets uh, and, and Peter the Clueless Drinker, because I think both of them actually did it, um, you know, they were, um, they were talking about this minty thing and you really get that out of this beer. Behind the front curve of the palate, of course, that's where that nice oily bubble comes out um, and it gives you all these big fruity esters. So for me with this one, there is a little bit going on. I can really get that, the, the fruitiness, it almost feels like it has a little bit of a coconut infusion to it, which is quite interesting actually. Um, but yeah, when you take the beer in at first, it's a nice big oily orange and you can feel it just pushes forward on the palate. So I'd say the front part of that fruity note on top of the coconuts is a nice big oily orange but as you go towards the back of the palate, uh, sorry not the back of the palate, the back of that front part of your tongue, the back of that oily bubble, it's got a few darker kind of tropical notes to it, more more like a kind of passion fruit, not really a, not dark enough to be a grapefruit in my mind, so it's mainly a kind of darker passion fruit and a lovely bright juicy oily orange that comes out of this beer in terms of its, its fruity qualities. It's not the most complex beer in terms of its fruity qualities but um, it really everything goes together in this really quite nicely. When I compare this to other hazy New England IPAs that I've had recently, this one, it's for me, it's all about how the the mouthfeel comes across. It's got flavours that you'd quite often expect, but the coconut notes and some of the woodiness that's in there as well, and um, those are those are quite quirky to me. Other people from across the world might. That maybe in America where drinkers are a bit more used to Sabro might be used to that of course but to me this one th those are the two quirky kind of points about this beer I like the almost minty freshness that it has too so that's a very kind of interesting point about this uh, this particular beer so yeah this this is awesome this one I really like this and it'd be a bit of a shame um, if they only did this once actually I'm not sure they have done some they have rebrewed some collaborations and things like that but I think with beer bibliotech it does tend to be the case that um, you know the, the the collaborations do tend to be one-off but I think this would be a shame if um, if it is only going to be a one-off but these guys as I say beer bibliotech are capable in different styles of IPAs the um, I'm not even I think it was the I'm not even aware this is happening 
um, or the I'm aware this is happening. I forget the exact name, but the West Coast IP I had from them in the last video was uh, was awesome, and they've done some very good black IPAs and stuff like that as well. I think this is probably the best hazy. Um, IPA that I've had from them. The Moment of Clarity, the Paleo that was for one of the GBG Beer Weeks was also very good as well and this one only makes me more curious about what Finback have, uh, have to offer as well. So do give me, as I said in the Amundsen review, do give me some Finback recommendations so I can choose a few of their um, very good beers to review for you later in the year. Um, but in terms of the mouthfeel of this one then, that's the last thing we need to look at. To me, this is quite a full-bodied beer. The carbonation is very smooth. It's got that big, thick, kind of creamy backbone to it. But I find that this beer has a nice level of oiliness to it as well. And I think the oily qualities that it has bring out some of the fruity notes. There's a lovely... Um, there's a lovely kind of bitterness to this one, but I think I'd be surprised if it was more than the standard 30. Um, it does have a bit more spiciness to it but I would be surprised if it is any more than 30 IBUs. The fruitiness, like I said, is a lovely big oily, orangey quality and the malt base is quite thick and creamy. It's big and oaty. I'm surprised that they're saying there's not wheat malt in this. I think there must be there must be a little bit in this, to be honest, because it does have a little bit of that wheat bitiness at the back of the palate, but also some nice crisp notes, which I suspect are from Pilsner malt as well. But overall, this is a lovely um, New England hazy IP. It's 7.5%. It's got a good level of body as well. For a 7.5 percenter, I find this one pretty thick actually, because usually with this style it gets thicker the higher you go up the um, the ABV train, if you like, or the ABV ladder. But um, yeah, a beautiful beer. But that's uh, you know that's expected when you've got these two breweries involved here. So let's leave it at that for this one. This one was the they're playing our song number 269. Have I got that right? Yep, number 269 from Beer Bibliotheque in Gothenburg here in Sweden, brewed in collaboration with Finback Brewing from Queens over in New York. A lovely beer, and I'm glad I was able to review that for you. So yeah, thank you again for watching my reviews. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are from Beer Bibliotheque. Give me some recommendations for Finback, of course, for when I go out there, and uh, I will catch you guys very soon. Until the next time, slander just now, and I'll catch you guys later. The, they're playing our song, 7.5 5% New England IPA from uh, Beer Blue Tech, Gothenburg in Sweden and Finback in Queens, New York in America. Slanja Skull.